journey towards excellence, Caraga State University has carved several milestones along the way. These milestones represent our accomplishments as an institution of higher learning in Caraga region. We are one of the only five souks in Mindanao and uh, one of the only 20 souks in the entire country that has been awarded Soup level 4 based on CHED, DBM, and PASO innovation. Fab Lab is an interdisciplinary space for innovation where anyone can make 
with almost anything. The laboratory was established to inspire entrepreneurs and artists to turn their ideas into new products and prototypes by providing access to an array of advanced, flexible digital manufacturing tools. Navigatu is Karaga State University's very own technology business incubator funded by the Department of Science and Technology, Philippine Council for Industry, Energy, and Emerging Technology Research and Development, together with the Department of Trade and Industry. Virtual Learning Facility is a physical space in Karaga State University where the smart room with smart gadgets and display are using augmented reality interfaces. The Caraga State University Phil Lider One project, also called as Blood Hazard Mapping of the Philippines using light detection and ranging, Caraga region. <laughs> Educational institution, Caraga State University continues its endeavor for excellence in instruction, research, extension, and production as it assumes its role for regional and national development. In pursuit of academic excellence, Caraga State University currently offers programs in the College of Engineering and Geosciences, College of Computing and Information Sciences, College of Forestry and Environmental Science. College of Agriculture and Agro-Industries, College of Arts and Sciences, and College of Education, all of which are accredited by the accrediting agency of chartered colleges and universities in the Philippines. Bachelor of Science in Mining Engineering is a multifaceted discipline that offers a broad range of career opportunities in various technical areas. Mining and Mineral Resource Development Operation and Management, Government Service, Academe, Mine Environmental Enhancement Services, Mine Research and Development, Mining Consultancy Services, Sales and Marketing Jobs in Mining, and Oil and Energy Industry. Bachelor of Science and Genetic Engineering Program are expected to be able to execute control surveys, mineral, hydrographic, and topographic surveys, photogrammetric surveys, gravimetric surveys, and astronomical observations. Possible occupations include genetic engineer or surveyor, photogrammetrist, cartographer, GAS specialist, remote sensing specialist, academician, consultancy, government technical service, quality assurance engineer, project manager, hydrographer, information systems analyst, assessor, realtor, and appraiser. Bachelor of Science in Electronics and Communications Engineering. Applications in this field are in biomedical, communications, industrial control, analytical instruments, image processing, telecommunications, information and communications technologies, consumer electronics, computer networks, and automation. Such applications vary from digital, analog, microprocessor-based, or very large-scale integrated circuits. The Bachelor of Science in Agricultural and Biosystems Engineering field of specializations include AV Machinery and Power Engineering, AV Structures and Environment Engineering, AV Land and Water Resources, AV Process Engineering. Possible Career Opportunities Research Academe Construction firms and industry, government agencies and offices, consultancy, and agricultural and bioprocessing plants. The Bachelor of Science in Computer Science, Bachelor of Science in Information Technology, and Bachelor of Science in Information System. Possible occupations, a software engineer, a system software developer, research and development computing professional, application software developer, computer programmer, systems analyst, data analyst, quality assurance specialist, software support specialist, and academicians. The College of Education is a college and a university that provides quality and relevant teacher education programs, such as the Bachelor of Elementary Education, 
Bachelor of Secondary Education, Major in Mathematics, and Bachelor of Secondary Education, Major in Biology. Bachelor of Science in Agriculture and Bachelor in Agricultural Technology. It is a four-year program designed to provide students with a technical knowledge in crop raising, agricultural chemicals, fertilizers, integrated pest management, seed conditioning and technology, and other areas related to production and quality control in the food and fiber industry. Other careers in this profession include crop scientists, horticulturists, agronomists, plant pathologists, plant feeder, and even an agricultural economist. The Bachelor of Science in Agroforestry, Bachelor of Science in Forestry, Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science. Possible careers, technical consultants, supervisors, researchers, environmental planning and design, waste and environmental assessment, and environmental policy. Bachelor of Science in Biology. Bachelor of Science in Biology qualifies one towards a teaching assistant in a college or university with additional courses in education and passing of the licensure examination for teachers. A Bachelor of Science in Biology graduate can also be employed as a high school biology teacher. Also, graduates of the program can pursue or undertake postgraduate education in biology and allied fields. Bachelor of Science in Chemistry. This program can work in different laboratories, such as in mining laboratories, analytical laboratories, and crime laboratories, such as a forensic chemist. Bachelor of Science in Mathematics and Bachelor of Science in Applied Mathematics. Thus, any graduate of the department can fit to, but not limited to, the following jobs. A teacher, researcher, statistician, financial analyst, and an economic consultant. Bachelor of Arts in Sociology offers solutions to social issues to enhance people's welfare. The possible jobs are a researcher, community relations officer, teacher, and a project development officer. Bachelor of Science in Social This program is a unique profession rich with meaning, action, and the power to make a difference. Jobs are medical social work, community organizing and social work, forensic social work, and other fields. Bachelor of Science in Physics is a four-year course study. Possible jobs include a researcher, analyst, or consultant, teaching, advanced studies, and other fields. Do you have a fascination for the human mind and wish to gain useful insights to apply to daily life? Acquire wide career options and opportunities. Bachelor of Science in Psychology is the program for you. A career in psychology will take you to the field as a psychometrician, counselor, and a psychologist. Good morning everyone. I hope you are all doing well and safe and please get ready since a few seconds from now the webinar is about to start. All right, so to formally start this event, may I request everyone to be still for the invocation and singing of the Philippine National Anthem via audio-visual presentation.
Let us put ourselves in the holy presence of our Lord. Our dearest Heavenly Father, thank you for making all things possible. We are grateful for all the blessings you are pouring upon each one of us, despite the challenges we are all currently facing. Thank you for blessing us today with this wonderful opportunity to meet virtually and learn together in this awesomely exciting one month. May your blessings of wisdom and guidance be upon us all through the sharing and impartation of knowledge and skills by our resource speakers, facilitators, and moderators. all of us learn together, upgrade our competencies, and capacitate us to build help in the development of our learners' lives and communities in the spirit of their love and generosity. Humbly commit every part of this webinar to you as we all bring you the glory, honor, and praises for your kingdom and holy name's sake. precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. again. I'm Art Kauba, a faculty member of the Department of Genetic Engineering of Caraga State University and welcome to today's webinar, Hashtag Resist, Hashtag COVID-19, a two-part webinar on responsive and intelligent suppression of COVID-19 and its societal impacts using spatial technologies, which is organized by SciTech 4 Dev Forum 2020 and the Caraga Center for Geoinformatics. So today is the first part of the webinar, and for your information, this webinar is recorded, and we are also live on Facebook at the SciTech for Dev Forum FB page. So to all our FB Live participants, hello there, and please like and share our live stream. And don't forget to include the following hashtags, hashtag resist COVID-19, hashtag SciTech for Dev 2020, hashtag navigating the new normal, hashtag padayon sa paglambo, hashtag bugsay pa more. All right, so now let me check if the participants are ready for today's webinar. So I encourage you to please use the chat box and share to us your name, affiliation, and how you feel today. So come on, guys. So please share to us how you feel today by typing in the chat box. All right, so 
At this moment, I would like to acknowledge the virtual presence of our university president, Dr. Anthony M. Pinasso, the vice president for research, innovation, and extension, Dr. Ruena P. Varela, the dean of the College of Engineering and Geosciences, Engineer Miriam M. Santillan, the director of Caraga Center for Geoinformatics, Engineer Jojin R. Santillan. Our speakers and, of course, attendees, good morning to all of you. All right, so to officially open this webinar, let us all welcome with a virtual applause the director of the Caraga Center for Geoinformatics, Engineer Jojin R. Santillan. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning, participants who are watching right now in Zoom and in Facebook Live. Good morning to our president, Dr. Anthony M. Pinasso, to Dr. Rowena Barella, our vice president for research, innovation, and extension, and of course, to our distinguished speakers for today's webinar, Dr. Estuar, Sir Lian, and Sir DJ. They will be formally introduced later on. So thank you very much for joining us in this uh, very important webinar, which is one of the exciting events of the 2020 offering of the SciTech for Dev Forum. So just, uh, I would like to share to you um, about our center, which is the organizer of this webinar. So this webinar is organized by the Caraga Center for Geoinformatics or CCJO, which we consider as an inter uh, interdisciplinary center for the conduct of research, innovation and extension activities in the field of G uh, geoinformatics. So our field of Expertise revolves around geospatial technologies and approaches such as remote sensing, photogrammetry, geographic information system and science, global navigation satellite system, and web mapping. And we use these technologies and approaches to understand and address environmental and societal issues and problems that are geographic in nature. So our field of uh, for the past years, we have those fields of expertise to undertake R&D programs and projects with financial support from the Department of Science and Technology and its Council. And among these projects or programs are uh, includes the flood hazard mapping of Caraga region using light detection and ranging remote sensing technology in collaboration with the University of the Philippines, the JUSA from Mindanao program in collaboration with the uh, various higher education institutions in Mindanao, that includes Ateneo de Sambuanga University, Central Mindanao University, MSU IIT, and uh, UP Mindanao, with funding from the Philippine Council for Industry, Energy, and Emerging Technology, or ISHER. Our center has also organized uh, local, regional, and national events seminars, trainings, and conferences as one of the ways to share our R&D activities to educate people about geoinformatics and its applications, and most importantly, to contribute to the continuous professional development and growth of our stakeholders. And uh, with the current situation that we are all facing right now, the COVID-19 pandemic, our center must find ways to continue providing timely and relevant information to the public. That is the reason why we are having this webinar entitled uh, Responsive and Intelligent Suppression of COVID-19 and its Societal Impacts Using Spatial Technologies, or we refer to this as RESIST COVID-19. So you will notice that RESIST is actually an acronym, but uh, we make use of that acronym as one way for us to express our need to withstand the action or effect of COVID-19. So the goals of this, of this webinar is to highlight spatial technologies like satellite remote sensing, global navigation satellite system, and geographic information system, particularly focusing on how it is helping us resist COVID-19. So for this webinar, we will be featuring three technologies and for today, we will be featuring Faster, which was uh, which is an application developed by the uh, Ateneo de Manila University. 
So we will have exciting talks for today from our speakers from Ateneo de Manila University. And all of them, all their talks will revolve around faster. So with that, um, I hope that this morning will be an uh, intellectually rewarding for all of us. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Sir Eugene, for sharing with us the background of the Caraga Center for Geoinformatics and its applications, as well as about this webinar. All right, and now to formally welcome us all to this event, let us hear a message from the University President of Caraga State University, Dr. Anthony M. Pinasa. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, uh, Engineer Art Kaoba. Our highly esteemed research speakers, Dr. Maria Regena Hustina A. Stuar, the Executive Director of the Ateneo Center for Computing Competency and Research, or simply ACRI, Mr. Lin Franzel Yao and Mr. Daniel Joseph Benito, both from the Department of Mathematics of Ateneo de Manila University, our Vice President for Research, Innovation and Extension, who is behind this annual Science and Technology for Development Forum 2020, Dr. Rowena P. Varela, Dean, College of Engineering and Geosciences, Engineer Miriam Aquinano Santillan, the organizer of this webinar series, the Caraga Center for Geoinformatics, led by its indefatigable and dynamic center director, Engineer Jujen Santillan, participants from different places uh, of the country and even beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant morning to each and everyone. At the outset, I would like to welcome you to this two-part webinar organized by CCJO. This webinar is one of the learning events of the SciTech for Deb 2020, which is an annual scientific tradition of the Caraga State University. Indeed, as what we have said in our prayer, this is a wonderful opportunity to meet virtually and learn together. Recognizing science, technology, and innovation as critical to the achievement of sustainable development and to addressing the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, this forum brings together key stakeholders from the government and industry, researchers, extension workers, and students to foster dialogue on relevant research, development, and innovation, or simply RDI issues and prospects. It is hoped that such an intellectual exchange of views would eventually lead to the exploration of potential solutions to many pressing concerns facing humanity and to the discovery of new directions for future RDI activities and collaboration. Continuing the momentum in building RDI-based development networks, toward navigating the new normal is central to the forum. Undoubtedly, science and technology must be put into practice in all levels of productive activity to serve its role as a prime mover of development. This s and for Development Forum is anchored in the theme, Navigating the New Normal, with slogan in our local language, Padayon sa Paglambo, Pugsay Pamor. This theme is fitting relevant and timely as we are in the midst of a global health crisis. As such, universities like Caraga State University and Ateneo de Manila University need to reposition themselves in order to respond to the challenges brought about by this unprecedented human crisis. The university has to explore new ways of doing things in delivering quality education and to pursue research and innovation responsive to the needs of the changing times, characterized by so much volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. One of the important issues and areas of concern the university is interested at is in the use of spatial technologies in responding and intelligently suppressing COVID-19 and its societal impacts. Thus, the CCJO will bring you a uh, hashtag resist COVID-19, a two-part webinar on responsive and intelligent suppression of COVID-19 and its societal impacts using special technologies. This webinar features special technology-enabled applications and studies on combating societal impacts of COVID-19. So for today, the first part of the webinar will focus 
on faster faster with triple s which means feasibility analysis of syndromic surveillance using spatiotemporal epidemiological modeler for early detection of diseases and to uh, corollary topics, identifying bar barangay hotspots using the spatial autocorrelation of infection rates and determining barangay relative risk, evasion, spatiotemporal analysis of COVID-19 cases in the Philippines. As I have earlier acknowledged, our Ateneo de Manila University uh, faster project leader and researchers will be our research speakers for today and they will be properly introduced soon. For our second part, which would be held on Monday, October 19, 2020. The topics uh, include Trump's Plus enhanced tracing for allocation of medical supplies, as well as Gideon, which means global impact detection from emitted light onset of COVID-19 and nitrogen dioxide. Our speakers will be Engineer Lucian V. Ramos, Trump's Plus project leader from the Training Center for Applied Judeci and Photogrammetry of the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and Mr. Nick to be a senior consultant on social impact of serolytic research services. So to end this welcome message of mine, allow me to quote Ritz Bowlers, who once said, the old way of doing things has been completely disrupted. And today we have the ability to create what the new normal will be. As our old ways of doing things crumble, we are embracing a new normal, one where we are more flexible more resilient and more considerate of others around us, deeper into our purpose of existence, a reason for living, and where we focus on what really matters and on what really counts. May we find this webinar um, awesomely exciting, intellectually rewarding, insightful, and engaging. Mabuhay and God bless us all. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, sir, for the message. Indeed, Caraga State University will continue to deliver services and programs that will contribute towards the development of Caraga region and beyond. All right, so before we get started with our first topic for today's webinar, let me present to you the following webinar rules. Right, so the webinar rules. First, participants other than the host, speakers, and moderator are muted. Questions for the speakers are most welcome through the Q&A box, but not in the chat box. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's speakers by typing your questions into the question and answer tab. Make sure to write the name of the speaker who will answer your questions. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect this and address, address them during the question and answer session or panel discussion. Next, stay focused, avoid multitasking. We encourage you to listen attentively and stay with us until the end of the talks. And last is fill out the attendance during the start of the webinar and online evaluation form after the webinar. The online evaluation form can be accessed after the webinar. An electronic certificate of participation for each webinar part will be given to participants who have registered, fully attended, fully attended the webinar. It's either via Zoom or FB Live and have accomplished the online evaluation form. Make sure that you entered the correct name and email. Since certificates will be emailed to the registered email address used in the forms. All right, so those are our webinar rules. So again, this webinar is recorded and we are live on Facebook. So if you want to watch this webinar again or catch the moments that you missed, visit the SciTech for the forum Facebook page and feel free to view the recorded video on that page. So once again, to all our FB Live participants, Please like and share our live stream and don't forget to include the following hashtags. So it's in the screen, hashtag resist COVID-19, hashtag SciTech for Dev 2020, hashtag navigating the new normal, hashtag padayon sa paglambo, hashtag bugsay pa more. All right, so are you now ready to gain knowledge from our speakers? 
I hope everyone is now ready. So now we can begin. And to introduce the first speaker, may I call in the Dean of the College of Engineering and JU Sciences, Engineer Miriam M. Santillan. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It is my honor to introduce to you our first speaker. Our first speaker is one of the outstanding women in the nation's service or town's awardees for 2019 in recognition of her work on social science and computer science and social psychology, particularly in the design and implementation of health, disaster, agriculture, and ICT-based platforms for Filipino communities. Her research makes sense of group behavior in the digital world through a social psychological lens applied in computing technology to benefit the public and the nation. She is a full professor of the Department of Information Systems and Computer Science of Ateneo de Manila University and the Executive Director of the Ateneo Center for Computing Competency and Research, or ACRE formerly the Ateneo Java Wireless Competency Center. She also heads the Ateneo Social Computing Science Laboratory, where her team works on social, behavioral, and organizational predictive analytics, modeling, and social network development and analysis. She is also the project leader of FASTER, the web-based disease surveillance platform currently being used by the Philippines Department of Health to help forecast possible cases and scenarios on the spread of COVID-19 in the Philippines. For us to learn more about FASTER, let us welcome Dr. Maria Regina Hostina E. Escobar. Good morning to everyone. Um, good morning to our president, Dean, uh, uh, Mr. Anthony, Dr. Anthony Penaso, uh, our VP for research. Good morning. The development, um, uh, Dr. Rowena Varela, Dean. Thank you, Dean Miriam, for that very nice introduction. And of course, Director Engineer Jo Jean for uh, thank you, Mom. Thank you. Good morning. inviting us no, to this um, conference. It is really an honor and a privilege for us to be able to present our work to our academic community, something that is very rare nowadays no? because we are very, very busy with the daily task of monitoring our COVID-19 um, cases. No? Um, uh, before we, I know that the conference is really about geosciences, no? but uh, before we, we listen to the geospatial aspect of the project, I, uh, I, I I informed Jojean that it is best that we give you an introduction of the project itself, the platform, and how we arrived at the geospatial part. And then maybe at the end of the, the three presentations, we can discuss the relevance of, uh, uh, of FASTER uh, today and in the future in relation to disease surveillance uh, and, um, and epidemic monitoring. So, so um, without further ado, I would like to uh, share my screen now and begin my presentation. Is that okay, Joji? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So the title of my presentation is Faster, Enhancing Disease Surveillance for COVID-19, an Introduction. Allow me to begin by describing what disease surveillance is all about. No? So disease surveillance is the cornerstone of public health decision making and practice. No? At the onset, it is really used for early detection, prediction, and prevention of the spread of diseases. No? It is not something new. Our government has disease surveillance tools uh, um, since the start of probably the e-health uh, um, uh, e -health agenda in 2010-2011 when uh, we institutionalized e-health systems no, for, for health monitoring. 
uh, disease surveillance platforms are not only used for early detection, but more so they're, they're used for policy decisions. When you have information about the disease and its spread, you can come up with policies, which is now translated into planning, implementation, priority setting, and then resource mobilization and allocation, which is essentially what is happening today. Um, a disease surveillance platform is used for detection, it is used for reporting, for confirmation of these reports, for analysis, and also for feedback. In 2016, we envisioned a platform uh, that will not only provide uh, basic uh, disease information, but will incorporate information from different sources of data. Okay, um, so FASTER was born out of that idea that we wanted to provide a platform that will do syndromic surveillance. No? So syndromic surveillance means that you are getting information from different sources uh, related to a particular disease. It could be a symptom, it could be a confirmed case, it could be about the weather, it could be about the location of uh, where the disease is coming from or the outbreak. So the title of the project then was Feasibility Analysis of Syndromic Surveillance Using Spatiotemporal Epidemiological Modeler. So again, in 2016, we were using STEM, which is an IBM-based uh, disease uh, modeling platform. So it's open source, it can be downloaded and can be used until today. So the, the STEM part is the Spatiotemporal Epidemiological Modeler for early detection of diseases. The concept is that it is ICT based um, for near real time early detection of outbreaks, which means that for it to be near real time, your data should be coming uh, from different systems that, that can report in real time or near real time. And not only should it provide basic numbers, but we wanted it to provide geospatial and predictive analysis. Uh, and also allow us to develop disease uh, models, which will be used for scenario-based projections. So on the right side, you will see the original framework of FASTER. Uh, so where we have in the middle, uh, different sources of data coming from news, coming from PIDSR, which is the government disease surveillance system, coming from social media. When we report that we're not feeling well, or when we report that we may have fever, or when we report that we will not go to work, you know, our possible correlates of a particular disease. You know. And then of course, for, uh, from our electronic medical records. At the bottom, you will see the different designs of the models. No? So we, we have base disease modeling, where we do compartmental modeling, time series modeling, metapopulation modeling. And then we also have syndromic surveillance prediction models and um, using, using STEM and then using combinations of different platforms. But the user only sees the top part where you can register, or manage your, your um, account and do a visualization and interpretation of the data that you see um, on the screen. So the project started in 2016, uh, where initially we were assigned to develop first, no, first and foremost, without even the platform, the models, no, because that's the core of any disease surveillance platform. So we were developing uh, models for dengue, measles, and typhoid, the innovation is that it is localized. No? What does that mean? We do not only use parameters from literature, but we compute them and incorporate them in the models. And we compute them because we are able to get data from our local systems. Okay. And then the second year was to include uh, visualization of the collection of syndromic data. So these would be symptoms, no? not necessarily confirmed cases of dengue, measles, typhoid, but symptoms of these as reported from electronic medical records and from our communities. Our pilot site was Region 6. And then on year three, uh, we started institutionalization, meaning because this platform was really developed for use by our Department of Health. So we started training uh, members of the Department of Health as well as uh, epidemiology um, bureau uh, and also for region six. 
And then last July 2019 mm -hmm. was the official turnover of the platform to the Department of Health. And then in 2020, we had COVID. So what you see on your screen is the original version of FASTER, um, where we would have the different, the three diseases that we have modeled. And then on the right side, you will see a dashboard that shows you a forecast. Okay. Other views in the old version of FASTER would be a dashboard for syndromic historical trend. So this is a trending of fever and cough in a particular place. And then we also had um, an SMS-based uh, platform, faster.tugon.ph, which would allow our citizens household from the household report their symptoms um, for verification in the electronic medical record. And we also had a mobile application which allows our event uh, surveillance officers to go on the field no, to collect data and also see the, the reports from their mobile phone. Last March 23, 2020, we formalized COVID-19 Philippines LGU monitoring platform. So this is now faster. No? And last September, we turned over the platform in full to the Department of Health. That's why there's a different look and feel already of the current version of faster to a DOH themed faster. Um, the core of FASTER is the Faster Than COVID-19 model, which I'm very proud to say was initially designed by a member of Caraga State University, Dr. J. Makalalag. So he's a graduate of the Ateneo de Manila University and is a member of the mathematical modeling team of the mathematics department. And the initial design of the model uh, st was started by J and, of course, improved by the whole team now. Uh, and with us today is Dian and DJ, who are members of that team. So this is the design of the faster than COVID-19 model. So when we talk about a model, we talk about a, <clears throat> a, a disease compartmental model using differential, ordinary differential equations. We have six compartments here, where S is your susceptible population, which means every one of us, but some of us will get exposed if we go out and get exposed to people who are actually infected already. So when we are exposed at that time period, we are exposed, we are infected, but not yet infectious. At, after some time, we become either infectious asymptomatic or infectious symptomatic, where we manifest symptoms. And then um, when we manifest symptoms, usually that's the only time we have ourselves get tested. Um, and then once positive, we are now in the confirmed compartment. And um, of course, we, there's a recovery period and then we recover uh, or not. Okay, so this is the, the, the design of the model. And this model was translated into code, which, we, um, which started the, the development of the platform. So we started with the platform with the, with the development of the model. <clears throat> Today, this is what FASTER is, no? So FASTER now collects data sources from different, um, <clears throat> different uh, systems. We, all, we, we have our main source for our case uh, investigations from covid Kaya. So it's the official case investigation platform of the Department of Health. And all our regions and all our LGUs, uh, provinces, all hospitals are supposed to report uh, their COVID-19 uh, cases in covid Kaya. Aside from that, we also have data coming from the DOH data drop. The data drop uh, contains uh, a collection of, of, of information relation, in relation to our health capacity. So nandito yung hospital, uh, hospital capacity natin, nandito yung ating um, human resource capacity, okay? uh, among other things. No? Um, we also have non-health data because the indicator or the decision for uh, uh, escalating or decelerating a lockdown does not only need, uh, talk about health indicators, but also other non-health data, such as social, economic, and security data. And then other data sources would be coming from our contact tracing apps no? uh, and laboratory systems. 
but all of them uh, are designed in such a way that they are not owned by the systems. The data is not owned by the systems. They are owned by the Department of Health through the warehouses or data warehouses. Within FASTER itself, uh, FASTER now uses the data from the warehouse to now run the projection models and other statistical tools for our information consumers. No? So the information consumers that we have right now are the actual users of the system. So th these are the government agency people, our IATF, our LGUs, uh, DILG, um, and other institutions. No? But we are realizing that another set of information consumers are those who are developing other systems. So data that is now translated into meaningful information in FASTER is now ready to be fed again into other systems that need this kind of information, such as GIS platforms. Okay. Oh, wait. <laughs> okay. There. Okay. Now, this is our um, uh, DICT ICT COVID suite um, <clears throat> design. Okay. So, you will see here faster is on the rightmost side. No? So, it means that it is assumed that um, the information coming from the data source, which is Tanud COVID or Kira Contra COVID, our LGU apps, our contact tracing apps are all fed into the warehouse um, and is, is, uh, interop it interoperates with our laboratory information system and is now fed into the faster data warehouse for processing, which basically means analysis, uh, developing the analytics and the models and visualizing them. Okay. At the back end, this is what it looks like. So we have different sources of data managed by different types of services and visualized by different types of tools. So it's not one system. It is a lot of systems that go through a pipeline no? from data cleaning, data extraction, data cleaning, uh, data processing, mm -hmm. data analytics, data modeling, and data visualization, which are the steps actually of, of uh, data science. So this is another way of looking at how we do things. So from the data source to the data warehouse to the back end and then to the front end where we have the five indicators. So first and foremost, decision making is on health. Next is, is projections. Third is health capacity of the area. Uh, fourth is social economic status. And fifth is security. The right side now shows you the specific tools that we have in FASTER. So there is a lot and it is growing by the day, now, depending on the phase of the, of the pandemic we are in. <clears throat> this is what we do every day now. So it's a daily process. There's a weekly process. Okay? Um, there's a every two week process now, because these are models that are live and real time. You don't just run them one time. Every day there's new information that has to be cleaned, has to be pre-processed, has to be fed into the models, checked and verified, and then run it into production and then put it for visualization. All of that happens day in and day out with the models being run for a minimum of four hours to a maximum of eight hours a day, no? running, just running the model. So we're running them already in high performance computing machines, no? uh, sponsored by DOST Coare. <clears throat> because you cannot run them in your local machines anymore. We have a large number of cases already. And why is it why does it take so long? So the models, the model is not just one model for the entire country. Uh, which is why sometimes when people say what is the status of the country, it's very difficult to generalize it because each location has a different state no? at a particular time. We have models, and this is how at best a disease compartmental model works. It's best localized. No? So we have models down to the LGU level. Okay? So each LGU for the entire country has a faster than COVID-19 model and then move it moving up to the provinces and moving up to the regions and down to the to the to the country level itself. Okay, so ganun po karami yung models na nira run namin every day. On certain days, hindi maganda yung model. 
And so we review it and run, uh, run parameters for estimations again. On certain days, uh, we need to do imputations. Actually, daily na po yung imputations na ginagawa ngayon. So maraming processes na nangyayari every day um, for the use of our information consumers. So ang nakikita na lang nila yung end product, which is the visualization. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> the next few slides will show you um, some of the screenshots of faster. Uh, I, I pulled the information just this morning. Um, and I focused it on Karaga, okay, the region. Um, <clears throat> take note that our source of data, so this is always a source of uh, argument no? or, or confusion, is, is the Department of Health data source. No? We have learned for, from the past six months that the data from the LGU and from the regions vary. No? Dunsa national. That's why there is a process of validation and verification. So depending on when you access faster, you may be at the stage where everything has been validated or it is still in validation. So there's always that caveat that information may be subject to change. No? But what does the dashboard look like? So for the information consumer, when the consumer logs in, ito yung una niyang nakikita. So you will have your basic statistics where you have your confirmed cases distributed to your active cases, asymptomatic <clears throat> and mild cases, critical and severe, your recovered and your deaths. No? <clears throat> this information itself can help our local government uh, partners to make decisions in relation to um, who do they, uh, in relation to the vulnerable population. So for example, if you have um, morbidity cases that are high, so you will know the vulnerability of your community or also by gender or by, by uh, barangay or by, by, by communities. Okay. <clears throat> we also have um, other statistical tools which are co-designed by the Department of Health. For example, our case doubling time, which tells us the speed of the outbreak. No? So does it happen every seven days? Does it happen every four, uh, 15 days or every 30 days? Meron bang nagkakaroon ng bagong case? No? So the, the, the more we have and the, 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 the often we have it, it means that mabilis yung uh, outbreak. No? And we also can do case more, uh, doubling time or mortality doubling time. <clears throat> Uh, the recent version of FASTER also allows us to adjust, no? to select the first date, whether at the start or at a certain date, okay? or whether it's a window case doubling time or short-term window, because there are a lot of interpretations of <clears throat> and preferences of case doubling time from our epidemiology experts. No? So things like this uh, have changed over time because of our close uh, relationship with our users, no? with a lot of feedback, the dashboard has uh, improved and is continuously being improved. No? <clears throat> so this is the latest one. Mainit init pa ito. <laughs> this will just be uh, launched uh, very, very soon. No? Um, so this is the latest dashboard for our LGU. The original version only had uh, LGU risk classifications on case doubling time and critical care utilization. But right now, as we transfer um, the management of, of the containment of the disease to our LGUs, they would need to know their indicators right away. So this uh, page will show them everything that they need to know in relation to their, to their cases. No? So it, it includes the, the active cases, the case doubling time, the RT, which is computed at the provincial level right now. And then it also has the number of new cases in the last 14 days. Um, and then the social risk, economic risk, uh, the population, and the average daily attack rate. No? So this is very new. This page is very new. Um, and then, of course, we have our growth rate <clears throat> and um, epidemic curve uh, based on report date. Um, so this is a standard, uh, uh, just not the number of cases over time. And then later on, we will have detailed presentation of the geospatial part. Uh, this is our uh, um, uh, LISA statistics, okay, where we identify important clusters that uh, need to be focused on by our LGUs. Uh, so this is in terms of prioritization already. Now. So, so, 
something as some from the general down to the more granular uh, important information for our LGUs. Okay, uh, this is also the attack rate. And um, so this is the cases. Uh, so this is the clustering, this is the cases, and this is the attack rate. Um, if you've noticed uh, down here, you can uh, download the GeoJSON file now. So this is this uh, maps can be used and fed into other GIS platforms. For example, if you want to measure, uh, put it in a, your resiliency map. And then of course, there's a um, <clears throat> uh, geospatial uh, visualization. I will try to run it. <laughs> Uh, okay, sorry, my mouse is not working, but it's supposed to see, uh, show you the simulation over time. And then uh, we also have our uh, regional uh, 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 critical care utilization rate. So this is, again, an important uh, item for our uh, decision makers uh, for lockdown. So for example, if you're, uh, you're in warning zone uh, for most of your uh, items in uh, health capacity, which includes mechanical ventilators, ICU, isolation beds, and bed wards, then it might be something that you need to consider in relation to uh, a specific type of lockdown for a specific place. Socioeconomic indicators are also provided, uh, assuming there is information uh, that can be extracted from that particular place. We also have um, social uh, indicators and security indicators, which can be viewed by uh, a few, no? because this is about crimes in the place. No? So uh, this is uh, continuously updated by our uh, PNP, no? uh, and it's updated every Friday. No? So at, in Caraga, right now, <laughs> ito po yung status, okay? Um, and then there is a legend on the different types of, um, of crime. Okay. okay, so that ends my, my introduction uh, to FASTER, the project itself. And um, I'd be happy to turn over the, the presentation back to our host. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Istuar, for an informative talk. So FASTER is indeed significant in terms of creating a predict predictive model for various diseases, especially the COVID-19, which allows forecasting of possible cases in a given area at a specified period of time. And also I would like to mention my math instructor before, our very own Dr. Jay Makalala, for the design of the faster than COVID-19 model all right so you can type you can still type your questions in the q a tab and the speaker will address it during the q a session so i hope i, I encourage everyone not to please specify your name and your organization when you ask questions so we can acknowledge you later on all right, so now let's move on to the second speaker. So once again, may I call in the Dean of the College of Engineering and JSI Sciences for the introduction of our second speaker. So we have Engineer Miriam M. Santillan. Thank you, Art. So our second speaker is an incoming doctoral student at Japan's Nara Institute of Science and Technology where his research will focus on the use of natural language processing for electronic medical records. He obtained his undergraduate degree in applied mathematics with specialization in mathematical finance from Ateneo de Manila University in 2016 and finished his master's degree for the same program in 2017. He was a faculty member of the Department of Mathematics from 2017 until 2020 during which he started working as a research proponent for the Community Welfare, Wellness and Wellbeing Laboratory or CW3 Lab. Currently, he works as a technical consultant for the FASTER project and continues his work at the CW3 Lab. Let us welcome Mr. Lian Franzel Yao. Uh, hello, po. good morning. So uh, I'll get started. I'll share my screen now. I am. 
Okay, uh, so uh, I'll be discussing about the uh, way we identify barangay hotspots using spatial autocorrelation of the infection rates. Uh, so, i sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, siguro to start, uh, this is going to be the outline of my presentation today. So, we'll talk about global spatial autocorrelation. We'll talk about a local version of this, local spatial autocorrelation. Then we'll look at how we uh, identify clusters in a map based on how they are correlated. Then lastly, we'll uh, take a look about the implementation and output uh, as also shown by Dr. Rina earlier in the presentation. Okay. Uh, so, siguro a good way to start for those who are not as familiar with spatial autocorrelation is Tobler's first law of geography. So Tobler's first law of geography states that everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. So uh, medyo analogous to the usual sense of correlation, but uh, we're looking at it in the context of a map wherein uh, a specified location is going to be correlated or we'll look at the correlation or relationship with that uh, location to its neighbors. Okay. So more than two things that you can consider for spatial correlation. So uh, with that, siguro we'll start by talking about contiguity or how we identify the neighbors of a specified location. So there are two main ways to, to do this. One is rook contiguity. So if uh, familiar with chess, the moves of a rook are either vertical or horizontal. So what this means is if you look at the center location, uh, yan po yung chosen area, then yung neighbors niya is going to be identified if they share an edge. So kung may edge or border na share, we consider it as a neighbor. Pwede kang mag back and forth. And another way to classify or to identify contiguity is C, queen contiguity. So in this case naman, even if you share just one point, basta magkadikit kayo sa map, even by a point, you will be considered as neighbors. Okay. So ayan po, uh, that's one way to, or two main ways to identify uh, the contiguity. So, uh, see, global spatial autocorrelation, this is the measure of similarity between neighbors across the entire region. So, uh, one statistic we use to uh, do this measurement is called the global Moran's eye. Uh, so, ito yung gagamitin. we'll use this as an example because of the local version of the statistic we use is a variation of this one. Okay. So the statistic is going to be uh, this uh, defined by this formula, i equals uh, n over s sub zero times the summation over i, summation over j of w i j times z i z j all over the sum all over i of z i squared. So c n that's just going to be the number of subregions. So in the context of the output of faster these are going to be number of barangays in a city. Kasi yung region po natin na ginagamit ay, si, ay a, specific, a specific city, then our sub-regions are barangays. So n is the number of barangays. Zi is going to be the deviation of the observation in sub-region i from the mean of the region. So uh, kunin natin yung average over the city, then zi is going to be the difference of the average with the observation for the barangay. So si wij naman, these are the weights, the spatial weights that associate subregion i to subregion j. So uh, the contiguity early on factors into the spatial weights. Si weights, we can define them to be binary just to indicate if neighbors or not, or we can use it as a standardized way na instead of binary one zero, ang gagawin natin is 
uh, one over the total number of neighbors. So fractional na siya instead of one and zeros. Then S0 is just going to be the sum of all weights. So, uh, and the range of J here consists of the neighbors of subregion I. So, yung way we compute spatial autocorrelation, if you look at the summation in the numerator, ayan po. So, for a specific I, ibig sabihin tipili tayo ng isang city, or rather, isang barangay, then the summation over J means that you're taking the neighbors of the barangay. So you're taking the deviation of the barangay, multiplying it with the deviation of the neighbors from the mean as well. Then there's a certain weight associated with those products, depending on how you define the spatial weights. Then if you do that for all barangays, uh, deviation with the deviation of the neighbors, then multiply by n over s sub 0 and divide by the sum over z i squared, yun na po yung nagiging uh, statistic natin for global spatial autocorrelation. Okay, uh, so in the next slide po, we'll look at the interpretations. So si global spatial autocorrelation can be zero, positive, or negative. So how do we interpret that? Kung positive spatial autocorrelation greater than zero, it means that the clustering or the behavior of the cases or the observations are more like this diagram here. So para siyang, ano, uh, if you have instant coffee and you put uh, powdered sugar on top, you can easily identify what is sugar, what is coffee. So they're still perfectly separate. So the higher the value of I na positive, the more separated they are. Then in the middle, ito actually yung gusto natin. So no spatial autocorrelation, I equals closer to zero. Na parang if you shake the mixture of coffee and sugar a bit, then you'll have some coffee that's still clumped together, some sugar that's still clumped together. But in other places in the container, halos fully mixed na sila, unidentifiable na kung uh, nasan yung coffee, nasan yung sugar. So that's where we get clusters. So when I equals zero, that's where you have some clustering involved. Then the third naman interpretation for negative spatial autocorrelation is when you fully shape the container and halos homogeneous na yung mixture. So uh, it's more like a checker pattern na everything is just fully mixed, fully integrated with each other. So in terms of identifying clusters, if positive spatial autocorrelation, there's really just two clusters. One for the coffee, one for the sugar. If negative naman, then there's no clustering kasi everything is fully mixed. So ideally, ito po yung kinahanap natin. See, no spatial autocorrelation para magkaroon ng clustering. So uh, this brings us to local spatial autocorrelation. Kasi si global, we'll look, we're looking at the entire city. Uh, what we want is to find a way to identify clusters. So we'll look into a localized version of the statistic. Uh, there's a general class of local indicators of spatial association. So the acronym is LISA. And uh, this decomposes the global indicator. So if it decomposes, what that means is if you take the sum, so pag, pag LISA, you have a statistic for each barangay instead of a statistic for the city. If you get the LISAs for each city, take the sum, it's proportional to the global indicator. Sorry. So the usefulness of this is it uh, helps or it identifies spatial clustering of similar values. So dito po tayo nag identify ng hotspots ng uh, cities natin. So uh, it relies on the principle of spatial heterogeneity, which means yung gusto natin is global spatial autocorrelation auto is close to zero. Kasi kung hindi siya cluster then hindi siya ma-identify based on local spatial autocorrelation. Okay? 
Uh, so the statistic that we use, yung kanina po is global Moran's I. So here we use the localized version, local Moran's I. And the formula is going to be uh, somewhat similar, pero hindi na po siya summation across I and J since per barangay na natin siya tinitignan. So the formula is just uh, ZI over M2 times the summation over J of WIJZJ. So, hindi na whole picture. Ang tinitingnan na lang natin is for a specific barangay, we'll look at the neighbors. So, parang nagkaroon tayo ng subset of the city. Okay. So, for this, Lisa, we interpret it in the same way we interpret si Spearman's or Pearson's correlation. So, positive uh, correlation, positive local Moran's I, means that you have similar direction. Kung mataas yung value for the specified barangay, mataas din yung value for the neighbors. Okay? And kung uh, low values, then low values din yung neighbors. Kung negative naman si local Moran's I, uh, it means that if high incidence rate yung specific barangay, low naman yung nasa neighbors. So parang reverse yung directions. Okay. So when we are talking about spatial clusters, we're talking about the neighborhood. So even if the uh, description is attached to the specific barangay, we're still describing the neighborhood that contains that barangay. Okay. So siguro we emphasize lang na uh, we're describing the neighborhood and not just a specific barangay. Uh, next is uh, what we do since Lisa is a statistic, then we can talk about significance or p values. So, sub regions or barangays with st statistically significant PISAs can be classified into one of the four types of spatial association. And we can even uh, categorize the types of spatial association uh, with clusterings or similar values. So, these are going to be. Uh, high incidence or high observations surrounded by high observations, so hotspots. Or they can be low observations surrounded by low observations, which are going to be cold spots. Or yung uh, medyo outliers or weird behaviors are going to be the associations of dissimilar values. So high yung nasa gitna, low yung nasa labas, or low yung nasa gitna, high yung nasa labas. So to get a visual representation of these four associations, we can actually plot the values on a Moran local scatter plot. So yung x-axis natin will be the observations. Then yung y-axis will be the spatially lagged observations. So ito po yung observations multiplied by the weights. So x-axis is for the barangay. Y-axis is for the neighbors of the barangay. So if you'll notice, uh, we can actually divide this into four quadrants. Etong nasa gitna po, that's going to be the mean observation for the city. Yan po yung origin. So high here means it's high relative to the mean of the city. And low similarly means low relative to the mean of the city. So, uh, siguro, if you'll notice lang, the upper right and the lower left quadrants are going to be clusters of similar values, the hot spots and the cold spots. Then, yung upper left and lower right, these are going to be your parang outliers, the similar values na sila. Uh, okay, so uh, with the implementation, so we'll, our computations are mainly done on R. And we have two main packages used, SPDEP and SP9. The data that we use are reported cases for the past two weeks. Uh, we'll also use population and also the map data. So yung use of population is because instead of using number of cases, ang ginagamit natin ay infection rates. Para po ah, mas comparable siya. 
Because if you have one case in a high population area, then baka hindi siya as significant as one reported case over a small population. So instead, we use infection rates. Uh, and our decision is to use standardized spatial weights, C1 over N, instead of binary. We're also using queen contiguity. And uh, we're using p-values to determine significant spatial association. So uh, if you look at the previous graph, kasi, parang hindi p-values yung basis because sakto yung hati niya. So yung decision basis for significance in this graph is a rule of using two standard deviations away. So may variations in decision of significance because walang... Uh, walang exact p-values si Lisa because walang specified probability distribution. So what we do is we use uh, an empirical method to determine the p-values and yun po yung ginagamit na basis to determine significance. Okay. Uh, so we also have to consider addressing outliers. So since in many barangays, there are no reported cases, and in some barangays, there are a high number of reported cases. So because of these outliers, there's high variability in the data set for any specified city. And it can, uh, uh, it can affect the reliability of the statistic. So what we do, we address outliers by implementing or using local empirical base estimates instead of the infection rate. So at this point po, hindi na infection rate yung ginagamit for computing LISA. What we're doing, we're using instead uh, an empirical base estimate instead of the infection rate. So the si empirical base estimate, what it does is it shrinks the infection rate to the neighborhood mean infection rate. So yung central barangay, uh, instead of just getting the infection rate, it brings it closer to the mean of the neighbors. So this way po, parang nag-even out yung observations, yung mga outliers natin naging closer to the mean. Okay, uh, so yung estimate natin is computed by getting the mean of the neighborhood plus a multiplier, which is the ratio of the prior variance to the unconditional variance, times the deviance of the observation to the mean of the neighborhood. So etong xi minus mi, para po siyang yung zi natin na, na mentioned kanina. Okay, so uh, by replacing infection rates with this, yung outliers natin lumalapit. So uh, to illustrate, consider a particular barangay, instead of using the observed infection rate, instead of using uh, the values for this yellow region, what we do is we bring it closer to the mean of the neighborhoods. So, ibig sabihin, itong infection rate will now be closer to the average of the darker yellow regions. So, nawawalan ng konting variability. The final output is going to look something like this, as illustrated by Doc Rina earlier. So we'll have a map of a city, and yung barangays, for those with significant statistics, we identify their clusters as either high-high, high-low, low-high, or low-low. Uh, so siguro to uh, understand easier what these clusters are, pag high, so there are two descriptors, diba? high, 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 low, low, high, low, low. Dalawang descriptors for each barangay. The first description is describing the specified barangay. But recall that we're using a smoothening process, the empirical base estimate. So hindi na siya describing just the barangay. It's actually describing, if you think about it, it's describing the neighborhood. Kasi it's closer to the mean of the neighborhood rather than just the infection rate of the specific barangay. So high siya, ibig sabihin, the neighborhood containing the barangay has relatively high infection rates. 
relative to the mean infection rate for the city. Okay? So yung second descriptor naman, if the second descriptor is high, what that is describing is, again, the neighborhood of the neighbors. The reason for that is because we are, again, using empirical base. So kung hindi tayo nag empirical base, yung unang high is for the neighbor, uh, the barangay, the second high is for the neighborhood. Pero since nag-smoothening tayo, parang nag-one step away tayo. One step further from the center. So the first high is the neighborhood. The second high means that the neighborhood of the neighbors, so one layer further, is also high, also has a high infection rate. And similarly po, pag low-low, ibig sabihin, the neighborhood has low infection rate and the neighborhood of the neighbors have low infection rate. Pag high-low, it's high neighbors surrounded by low neighborhood of the neighbors. Pag low-high, low surrounded by high. So, uh, siguro to remark, we updated our codes then kasi... Uh, it was considered na since we're doing this this smoothening process, paano naman kung nandito siya sa gilid? Paano kung ito yung chosen na barangay? Paano yung neighbors niya outside the city? So, nag-update na po kami. When we're considering the computations, sinasama na po namin yung uh, two barangays away para lang accurate yung results natin. Kasi kung hindi natin siya sinama, what, what happens is for barangays close to the border of the city, uh, the clustering becomes unreliable because you're disregarding the barangays outside of the city. So ayun po, uh, siguro for last remarks lang. The computation again uses infection rates, not number of cases. Though statistically speaking, pwede naman either. Uh, due to the smoothening process, the use of empirical base estimate, there may be counterintuitive results. So since we're bringing the infection rate closer to the mean of the neighbors, it can happen actually na initially, zero number of cases siya, pero yung neighborhood niya, high infection rate, and since we brought it closer to the mean of the neighborhood, naging high infection rate na yung barangay. So it can happen na zero cases, pero labeled siya as high. It can also happen na uh, mataas yung number of cases, mataas yung infection rate, pero labeled siya as low. So ano lang siya, a uh, word of caution of the results that they may be counterintuitive. But still, ang point, ang dinidescribe din naman talaga ng clusters natin is over a neighborhood and not just the specific barangay. So we still advise that if you're using this output, you still use other metrics compared with the visualization for the actual number of cases, for example. So uh, ayan po, I think that's the end of my presentation. So I'll stop sharing my screen and turn back over to the host. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Sir Lian, for giving us an idea how you identify identify barangay hotspots, which makes use of the local spatial autocorrelation. All right, there you have it. So if you have queries again related to Sir Lian's presentation, kindly type it in the Q&A tab and he will answer it during the question and answer session. All right, so we are now down to our last speaker. But before that, I would like again to check the energy of our participants. So can you please type in the chat box you're feeling right now? So kumusta po kayong lahat? Are you still there? Are you still all right? So let me check if... Andito pa ba kayo? Yes. So my comment that we're here. All right. So I hope everyone is still here watching us. Okay. So thank you so much. So now let's proceed to the next speaker for today's seminar. All right. So to introduce to us again our last speaker for today's webinar. So may I call in once again the Dean of the College of Engineering and Geosciences, Engineer Miriam M. Santillan. Thank you, Art. 
So our next speaker graduated from Ateneo de Manila University in 2016 with a degree BS Applied Mathematics with specialization in mathematical finance. He finished also his master's degree in the same institution in 2017. He worked as a research analyst in Banco, Banco Central ng Pilipinas under the Office of Systemic Risk Management. In his two years at the Central Bank, his works are often associated with network analysis and other empirical studies on macro-financial variables. He is currently a technical consultant of the FASTER project an instructor at the Mathematics Department of Ateneo de Manila University, and a project researcher for the Community Welfare, Wellness, and Wellbeing Laboratory. He is also engaged with some advocacy programs through his membership in non-government organizations like the Storytelling Project and Teach Peace, Build Peace Movement Incorporated. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome our next speaker, Mr. Daniel Joseph Benito. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning, Paul. Maraming salamat for the kind introduction. Thank you also uh, for inviting us to share our work with Pastor. So, uh, just a moment, I'll just share screen. Paul. Okay na po ba yung screen? Yes, sir. Okay. So, again, uh, good morning po sa inyo lahat. Uh, I'm Daniel Benito and I'll be my presentation. I'll, for my presentation, I'll be talking about determining barangay relative risk, a Bayesian spatial temporal analysis of COVID-19 cases in the Philippines. Uh, this is actually a model that is not yet official uh, part of the faster dashboard, uh, but with it is already in the last few stages. We're just finalizing some visualization and some model specification, and we hope to uh, put it up soon in our dashboard to provide additional perspective about a more localized dynamic of the disease. So to provide some structure for my talk, uh, here are the main three parts of my this, uh, presentation. One of my aim for today is to promote some appreciation and share the great potential of spatial temporal models by giving some brief introduction about this type of model. Then we'll proceed with the second part when I'll elaborate on the concept of relative risk, which is what is which is being estimated by the model, and go into some technical details. Then finally, show some model results and its contribution to the COVID-19 surveillance. So spatial temporal models from the name itself, spatial, which means space and temporal, which, which means time. It incorporates both uh, space and time information. Just as quick story time, the idea of using geographic information in medicine or in, in epidemiology can be traced back in the 19th century. During that time, cholera was one of the deadliest diseases in Britain, killing thousands of people. The community have believed that some kind of uh, airborne disease is the cause of cholera. But this is not the belief of a physician named Jon Snow. Uh, not the Jon Snow for the Game of Thrones fans. Uh, Jon Snow suspected that it's actually uh, Jon Snow tried to plot the incidences, the black lines, if you can see. Uh, he noticed that most of the cases actually appeared around the bro around broadsheet, wherein there's a community pump. And he actually suspected that 
it's actually contaminated water and not some airborne that is causing cholera. There was a struggle to believe this idea, but later on, out of frustrations, the local officials agreed to his suggestion to shut down the pump. And just a few days after, they experienced a big drop in cases and they are able to save more lives. This was perhaps the very first disease map that was well documented and well known. One key takeaway from this story is to view disease transmission amid a larger community, amid the context or the community surrounding the disease. The method of Dr. Snow is in mapping cases uh, may work in a small locality, but if we want to investigate a bigger space and if we want to see the uh, variations over time, this may not be that effective. But due to the advancement of available technologies and techniques, we are able now to study a phenomenon in a given space and over a period of time, uh, as well as implement more robust models. At the core of spatial temporal model is an attempt to understand, to understand space and time variations of case, case incidences. And this will allow us an analysis of more granular distribution of disease burden. And it will also allow us to explore uh, relationship between space or environmental factors and case incidences. Uh, for instance, the image at the right shows a spatial temporal map of the risk valley fever. Uh, the patient spatial temporal model underlying this was developed to explore how does ecological or climatic conditions such as rainfall or flooding can affect the distribution of mosquitoes that causes RVF. Understanding better this kind of relationship or patterns uh, shall aid in identifying areas of unusually high risk, measuring inequalities that will allow for better resource allocation and inform strategies to better mitigate further spread of disease. With the rise of COVID-19 around the world, spatial temporal analysis was also been considered and applied in some countries like a case in point in Spain. The map above shows predictions of cases using spatial temporal models. They also studied the relationship between the, uh, the relative risk of a certain lo uh, local area and temperature. If you recall, po, during the start of the pandemic, there was a belief that uh, weather conditions may affect survival of the virus. May mga narinig nga ako na uh, pag natap, mawawala na yung virus kasi somewhere na masyado na mainit, mamamatay na yung virus. However, this paper was one of the studies that contradicts the said point and concluded that there's actually no clear evidence of relationship between COVID-19 cases and temperature. As you can see uh, on the chart below, wherein zero is part of the credible interval. For our faster dashboard, the attempt to build a spatial, spatial temporal model was motivated by additional tools to understand the spread of disease at a more granular level, particularly barangay level, uh, then identify emerging local areas of concern. The LISA that was discussed by Mr. Yao is actually a very useful model, provide insights at the barangay level. But as we will elaborate, elaborate later, the model can provide additional perspective on how cases are spread in the city particularly provide a more continuous scale of intensity or severity of risk in a certain barangay. Uh, moreover, one limitation of ESA is that it is a static measure. The relative risk that we will discuss uh, incorporates or accounts not only for spatial information, but also temporal information. This allows us to predict in the next few weeks if there are new emerging areas of concern, or at least identify areas that may exhibit higher risk compared to what is expected. Now we'll go to some more technical details. Uh, perhaps it will be best to discuss the idea, which is the standard incidence ratio. Uh, this is simply the ratio between the actual cases of confirmed uh, actual cases in a certain local area at a particular time and the expected case for the same area, let's say Barangay R, at a certain time. Uh, standardized ratio of equal to one indicates that observed counts are actually the same as expected counts. So if we have a SIR of greater than one, it means that the actual observed cases are greater than, than what is expected. But what do we, how do we define what is expected? Uh, for our mod, there are many ways to compute this, but for our case, we simply define it as the population times the incidence rate of the city. The incidence, the IR is simply the number of cases in a city as a percentage of the city population. So the idea here is that 
Now, we are trying to apply the incidence rate from a larger space to a more local space, so from city to barangay. Then, for example, if city A has an incidence rate of 3% and the barang let's say barangay A has 100 population, so the expected case is simply 100 times 3% for barangay A, which is 3. So we expect a case of 3 for barangay A. One way to view also SAR is that it provides an extent of the heterogeneity in case and incidences in more local areas while, while taking into account their population. Uh, in the map to the left, we'll see uh, that darker, the darker the color is, it indicates a higher SIR or higher intensity or severity of case compared to those who have lighter colors. However, a concern with SIR is one sample variability. Uh, this is also a concern when you are trying to look at only at uh, actual counts of disease because for example, you have 100 people you tested, then 10 uh, had a result of positive. If you try it completely to a different set of 100 people, chances are the positive number of positive that you will get may be far from 10. Second is that, uh, as you can see, uh, it may be biased and un unreliable in areas with small population. As you can see in the image at the right, some areas have darker shade of red not because actually of higher incidence, but due to relatively lower population than others. Uh, a small change in small number of, a small change in number of observation can cause abrupt changes for cases of small numbers. So to address these two concerns, we try to utilize Bayesian hierarchical models incorporating information from its neighbor neighbor local areas and other variables to determine what we call a relative risk. You can view relative risk as, as, as an adjusted or smoothened SIR. The smoothing process allows for less bias in analysis and identify other variables that can be affecting the risk of a certain barangay. Uh, to understand or interpret relative risk, it's, it quantifies whether area R has higher or lower risk than the average risk in the population, let's say, in a set, compared to a set in, in a city le level. So, for example, if a barangay has a relative risk greater than one, it means that the barangay has a higher risk compared to the average risk in the city. So, just to give you an overview, this is the model, the equation that we used. So we model the C, which is the number of confirmed cases was on distribution with mean equal to the product of the expected case E and the relative risk U. So if you note that the relative risk is close to one, the mean of the confirmed cases of the distribution is similar or just close to the expected case. Meanwhile, if the relative risk is greater than one, indicating high relative risk, it means that the mean gets also larger and we might have higher chances of higher confirmed cases. Hence, another way to view uh, relative risk is that it's like a multiplier effect to your expected case. Then this relative risk can be uh, is driven or can be explained by some fixed and random effects. So the cur for our current uh, model, the current covariate or x that we are considering is population density for barangay. This is another limitation that we have since we're dealing with barangay level and we need to run it to multiple cities is that it was quite difficult to uh, consider other covariates with available data. Now, one special thing about patient models or patient spatial temporal models is what we call random effects. So the SR is what we call a spatial random effect. So this accounts for the spatial structure or the condition that observations are, it also factors in conditions that observations from neighboring regions exhibit higher correlation than distant regions. So it factors in information uh, around the certain locality. Then one way to interpret it is if it is greater than zero, the barangay are that that barangay specific barangay has a higher risk compared to other surrounding barangay after controlling for other covariates. Some papers that you will see actually about uh, Bayesian spatial temporal models, they actually just focus on this SR. But for our purposes, since we are also considered, uh, we are also particular or curious about the temporal trend, we uh, opt to focus on the relative risk instead. 
So there are also random effects uh, pertaining to time. You have some structured and unstructured temporal effect. Uh, you can view the tau and the phi, the sum of this, as capturing the citywide temporal trend, the time, the trend over time uh, on a city level. But for a barangay specific uh, trend that is being captured by your delta R sub t. Uh, one takeaway also from this is that each random effect has a process, underlying process of its own. So here's an overview of the method that we use. Uh, we start with providing the inputs to the program, uh, the model equations, the map structure. The map structure is very critical for the spatial effect that I discussed a while ago. Then uh, we input it to R in law, which estimates probability distribution of model parameters. Then we do model selection and validation. Note that the process is not linear. So if in the model selection and validation, we notice some problems, we go back to the first step uh, by trying to fix the model equation and see the kind of data that we're inputting. Then once it passes our model validation and we selected a better fit model, that's the time that we will plot it to the map using exceedance probability. Uh, we'll talk about this more later. So uh, I would like also to point out at this point that the estimation that we are doing is through R and LA. It's an R package. It's a very powerful package. Uh, when we talk about Bayesian statistics, one main challenge of it is, is the computing time. But R and is a very computationally efficient tool to uh, estimate using uh, that utilizes also Bayesian approach. Our inla is a rich discussion itself, but given the time, I'll just refer you to the reading below in the bottom right that you can see on your screen. Uh, since I understand that many of here are students, uh, let me give some remarks about Bayesian approach. So again, what we want is to estimate some unknown parameters to have an estimate of the relative risk. In the usual frequency uh, framework, or perhaps in most of your statistic classes, what we often compute is a point estimate, a specific number. We have some confidence interval. In contrast, the Bayesian approach, uh, we obtain a probability distribution over possible values of the unknown parameters. So yan, para may curve tayo uh, that can describe the possible values of the unknown parameter. And we can represent the uncertainty probabilistically. It is called Bayesian because it is based on the Bayes theorem, a way to compute your conditional probabilities. So for parameter estimation, what we do is we start with some prior belief, then we consider or update this uh, using data in order to obtain a posterior distribution. Because this is the model that we model. So for our, there are instances that you might not have prior beliefs about the uh, about the estimate or the parameter. So just like in our case, in for this model, for the Arabian model, uh, we use what we call an informative priors, and we just let the data to speak. So for model selection, there are many equations that you may consider, but to select which is the best equation, we do uh, model selection, what we use is what we call deviance information criterion and your widely applicable Bayesian information criterion. Uh, these are measures of goodness of fit and they consider a penalty for complexity. They just have a different, the difference ng sakin lang dalawa is uh, they have different ways of computing for penalty, but they're both measures of goodness of fit. And what we want is a lower DIC and the lower WAIC. So yung mga yellow na naka-highlight po, yun yung may mas mababang DIC of WAIC. We also do model validation by correlations of the actual data and the predicted data. Then we compare it to a baseline model. Then we also consider exceedance curve. Okay, so at this point, I'll just share mod some model results and uh, reiterate its contribution in COVID-19 surveillance. So here's a sample map uh, providing mapping the mode of the relative risk. A darker color implies higher level of relative risk or higher incidence than what is expected. But another quantity that can be mapped instead of the actual levels of the relative risk or the mode of the relative risk is to consider what uh, most literature call your exceedance probabilities. And this might be more accurate or insightful to look at. 
Uh, as mentioned in the previous slides, we use Bayesian approach, and this provides us an estimate of the posterior distribution of the unknown parameters. One advantage of this is that it allows us to ask questions like underlying probability. If you recall your statistics, the area under the curve represents a probability. So for our case, we can ask about the probability or the chance that the relative risk of a barangay will be greater than one. Again, uh, if you recall, one way to interpret your relative risk is that if it is greater than one, then the relative risk of the barangay is greater than the relative risk, uh, the average risk of the city. So we're particular with this, uh, the probability of RR to be greater than one. And some barangays have higher exceedance probability. So this red line, new red line, let's say, yan yung level na yung relative risk is greater than one. So kung mas malaking part ng distribution, uh, each curve here or distribution represents uh, the RR of, let's say, of a certain barangay. So may ilang barangay na yung majority or a big part of their distribution exceeds the parang threshold of one. So mas malaki yung exceedance probability nila kasi mas malaking part ng distribution nila yung lalagpas ng uh, malaking part ng distribution nila yung lalagpas dun sa red line na yun. So meanwhile, itong red na distribution, we expect it to have a lower exceedance probability kasi halos walang part ng distribution niya yung lumagpas sa one. So pwede ito yung mga barangay na wala masyadong case incidence or mas mababa yung severity of uh, incidences. Pero to better view this or analyze this, we map this probabilities into a map. So, yeah. Similar to the previous maps, a darker color implies higher exceedance probability or a higher chance that the risk of a barangay is greater than the average risk. Uh, this can the darker ones can be likened to those barangays with green distribution you, you saw in the previous slide. Kasi yung mga light, halos walang kulay, pwede nyan yung mga pink na distribution na nakita natin sa previous slide. So again, one uh, benefit of the model is that we can compare over a period of time a situation of certain barangays or how well or the distribution of the cases, uh, of the severity of cases or the risk. So may mga ilang barangays na initially for earlier week walang hindi pa white lang sila but some as you note yung iba sa nila bigla naging light red after a few weeks. Sorry I I wanted to show sana the map for a car pero I had problems in uh, downloading the maps. So ito na lang po muna sa So just to summarize how can this model contribute to the monitoring of COVID-19? Uh, since the model incorporates temporal information, it is able to determine current and emerging local areas with unexpectedly high incidence. Uh, note that it will, all, similar to Lisa, it can identify hotspots or ranked. So, yung may bar chart po kayo makikita sa gilid, so, i-rank namin yung mga barangay based on its riskiness, based on the model that we have. And then finally, identify other factors that can shape can be shaping the transmission, and this can actually vary from different from cities. The current that the current model that we have has actually very limited uh, covariates, but this does not stop the user or the model of the model to ask and figure out what is common among these identified areas with above average relative risk. There's so much things to know and under to be understand about COVID-19. But at the end of the day, these models are just tools to guide us, but it is still up to us to generate uh, more insights from the model results. Then similar to the story of cholera and John Snow, it might be interesting to ask, what could be our version of today's public water pump? What is that public water pump that must be shut, that we, that must be shut down to stop COVID-19 from causing more damages to our lives? And with that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I look forward to your questions and feel free to email me uh, if you want to know more about the model. Maraming salamat po. And stay safe. All right. Thank you, Sir DJ, for discussing with us how you determine relative risk for each local area, which utilizes the Bayesian hierarchical models incorporating information from 
neighboring local areas and other variables. All right, so there you have it. So again, if you have questions with regard to Sir BJ's presentation, feel free to type it in the Q&A tab and he will be glad to answer your questions later on. And please also join us up to the last part of this webinar. Okay, so at this juncture, we are now going to take questions. So as a reminder, your questions, uh, you can still submit questions through the Q&A tab. And take note that we will have a time limit for the Q&A session and panel discussion. However, we will try our best to accommodate as many questions as we can. So before I read the first question, let me invite our speakers again, Dr. Istuar, Sir Lian, and Sir DJ. And also may I invite the Vice President for Research, Innovation, and Extension, Dr. Wena B. Varela, to join us in the discussion. All right, so let me check if they are already here. So I guess, and dito na sila. So now are we ready to read the first question? All right, so here it is. We have here our first question. I guess this is from Anonymous. So first question is, uh, this question goes like this. How does it feel that FASTER has been officially adopted by the DOH as COVID-19 monitoring tool? So this, is, this qu question is addressed to all speakers. Who will answer first? Siguro I'll answer first. Um, hey, as, uh, uh, as a, I'm wearing a project leader hat no, in responding to this one. Um, it, is, uh, it is actually an honor no, for us to be able to, to develop um, something from the laboratory to something that's really very tangible and useful for our government, especially today, where uh, there is so much information out there and you really need one one, one, just one system no? to, to see, to transform the data into meaningful information for decision making. So we were very thankful that after proving ourselves uh, for several months, uh, the Department of Health uh, uh, has realized the potential of the platform and the potential of it uh, being uh, used even beyond COVID-19. That's it. All right, thank you so much, ma'am. So how about the other speakers? Sige, I'll go next. So for me, siguro from a young researcher, uh, it's similar to Doc Nina, it's a great privilege and honor to uh, serve the government uh, through this uh, platform. Also, as a math major, I'm always curious how can uh, I apply the different uh, highfalutin math that I studied in college to this to real world problems. And this one is a very good opportunity for that. But also at the same time, it's also there's also pressure uh, that you need to deliver well. But I just keep in mind that this is for greater good and that somehow pushes us to keep doing our best to this uh, COVID-19 monitoring. Okay, thank you so much, Sir DJ. So, Sir Lian. Uh, uh, siguro for me po, as uh, someone uh, among the three of us, ako, ako yung may least experience working with government then. So, uh, it's partly pressuring na being involved with something that's used to make big decisions, but it's also something na uh, coming kasi from our course na applied math in finance, uh, it's hard for me then to see how I can benefit, you know, society in, uh, in uh, improving the quality of life. Kasi uh, a normal trajectory of our course is to go into the corporate world and I've been trying to avoid that. So, uh, medyo reassuring to me that uh, I can still do my part. So, ayun po. 
So thank you so much, Sir Lian. So I guess FASTER, is in, this is just one of the milestones of the FASTER as it's being adopted by the national government, specifically the Department of Health. So thank you again. So now let's proceed to the second question. So this question is addressed to Dr. Istwar. So a lot of web-based COVID-19 platforms have been developed. So how is FASTER different from all of this? Okay, yes, I, I totally agree. No? There are a lot of dashboards out there, publicly available. Um, FASTER was really designed for, for LGUs. No? When, we, when we conceptualized the COVID-19 version of FASTER, it was really for LGU monitoring. Because at the end of the day, it would be the LGUs who would need to make these big decisions no? um, uh, about their communities. Um, the, the main difference, I guess, is una una iba yung model. Uh, every every modeling uh, modeling every model is different, no? So we we design the model based on the based on the data that uh, that we have, and based on our understanding of COVID nineteen coming from uh, information from literature initially, and then also understanding its behavior. Uh, as we see the data from day to day. No? So first, the first difference is that iba yung design ng model. And then second, iba yung assumptions niya. No? So it's very, for, for non-modelers, uh, they, they try to compare no, the models and then ask why are they not producing the same output. Um, it is because they are designed differently and then they have the different assumptions and probably different inputs. No? Um, but but more than that, no. So that's standard across all models. But what makes faster different is that it's operational, which means that it runs every day. It's it's not just a a, a static uh, model. It is an engine, no. That 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 gets its uh, fuel from the data coming in day to day, and then it is fed into this machine, no, uh, where we have all the source codes uh, running. To produce the the mod the model output and the visualizations, no? so that's that's I think the main difference that we have. We uh, automated the processes in such a way that we can generate new meaningful information day to day, and maybe uh, behind the scenes also uh, the main difference is that we're a big team. No, we have a, a multidisciplinary team of. Uh, 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 a group of math modelers uh, headed by Dr. L.B. De Lara Tuprio. So, yan yung uh, mentor nila, no? mentor ng mga mathematicians natin, pati ni Jay. No? Um, and then, uh, we have our computer science programmers and data scientists. Then, we have our systems developers no? who are developing the visualization part. And we also have our data warehousing experts. No? So, marami pong reason why FASTER is probably different uh, from the other uh, monitoring tools out there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Iswar. So, indeed, FASTER is still operational and it has a big team. Okay, so next question. This is for Sir Lian and Sir that, uh, DJ. So, can you describe how spatial technologies like GIS contributed to the development of the models and in accomplishing the goals of FASTER? Who will answer first, Sir Lian? Uh, sige pa, ako pong mauna. Uh, well, siguro it's, uh, it's something medyo new to the Philippines then to consider uh, spatial data in modeling or in modeling or in decision making. Uh, si, hmm. <laughs> uh, siguro the, the added uh, benefit and convenience of uh, developing like the R packages or the availability of the map files uh, make it convenient for us to utilize the the information because uh, we avoid the the process of uh, doing it on our uh, by ourselves like available na yung data available yung map files so it's really just a matter of uh, knowing where to look for them and uh, knowing the the right way to use the tools uh, 
And siguro one of the goals nga din po of FASTER is to provide a more uh, a spatial, spatial temporal approach in modeling and forecasting spread of diseases. Uh, DJ me added a podcast. Siguro to add quickly na lang, uh, siguro one of the contribution also is in terms of policy actions, at least the policy actions are grounded on not only number of cases, but also number of cases and uh, relating it to a space or uh, location. Kasi, for example, in the question of uh, restricting mobility, baka hindi rin ganun ka okay or maganda yung result kung sa lahat parang pantay-pantay na restricted yung mobilities. At least, uh, somehow, the the model allows us to identify anong mga areas yung may priority na mas kailangan higher yung restrictions. Ayun. Okay, so thank you, Sir DJ and Sir Lian. So certainly, a special technologies is crucial for the development of your models. All right, so this next question from Anonymous. So this is addressed to all speakers. How was the experience working with the Philippine government, especially the DOH, in developing FASTER? So, Dr. Istuar. Okay, thank you. Um, it's very different, no? especially because I come from academe and I've been in academe for all of my life. Um, but our lab um, has really focused on, on developing platforms for our country, no? for the government agencies. No? But this one was really a, parang a full implementation, unlike the other platforms where we just designed it and tested it in some, um, some aspects or some events. This is really something that was going to be used every day. No? And you know, nga, like what DJ has been saying, and Lian, no? parang we really have to make sure that we produce the right information because it's going to be used for decision making which will affect our lives no? our lives and uh where where we will be in the future so on and so forth so so the experience um was was enlightening uh because uh, there are so many things that um i i never knew our government agencies did no? how they how hard they work no uh, especially during crisis, no? something that's not tangible to us. What we see lang are, are the information we, we hear and we see in media. No? Uh, but, but working hand in hand with them, there are a lot of hardworking people. No? So that's one, one thing that uh, we have realized. They're very, very dedicated. That's why kami rin, we had to be dedicated. No? Like uh, 24 hours sila, 24 by 7 din kami dapat ganun. Um, uh, it's tiring because uh, we were not trained for public service. Um, also, we were not trained uh, how to accept public comments, no? So, parang nung umpisa, parang, ah, but ganon, no? So, meron kami mga ganon na reaction, but uh, we just tried to, uh, you know, uh, hold each other's hand and say, kaya natin to because uh, we're doing this for the country and we're doing this for our, our the people, no? Uh, so mixed, mixed yung ano, mixed yung experiences, and then mixed yung emotions. But at the end of the day, again, no, very thankful for the for the opportunity, and also very thankful to have wonderful uh, students no working with us no in in faster. Tige, yung iba, sila DJ, chara si Lian, baka may ibang experience. Would you like to share, Sir Lian and Sir DJ? Sige, ako po. Uh... Siguro medyo mixed din yung sharing ko na to with, aside from actually from working with FASER, even with my experience uh, in government in Banco Central. Uh, siguro compared sa acad academic work na medyo minsan mas, mas madalas mas lax yung deadlines or yung uh, challenging pero yung uh, period of doing the research or work mas manageable I think. Yung deadlines or yung work uh, flow for government. Siguro dahil din sa context or nature na COVID siya, mas mabilis yung turnaround ng mga tasks or deliverables, mas urgent, mas maraming urgent na deadlines. Uh, we often have shorter time to study or research certain topics. So, nagiging challenge. Mag, kailangan medyo magiging mabilis din yung learning curve, especially for us students na medyo bago pa din. Uh, I mean, needs more, some more experience about research. 
Then, siguro minsan it's also a balance of knowing. Kasi minsan, gusto mo aralin mo pa yung isang bagay or look for other aspects of the model, let's say. Pero, kailangan na siya eh. So, there's also a balance of knowing. Okay na to. Uh, this is also, uh, I've already captured the essential parts. Mga ni- nice to have na lang yung iba. Pero sometimes, you also need to make a call na, we, we need to study this further. Kasi nga, serious ang implications nito later on. So there's also that balance. And also, gaya nung sa rin doon ko na, before I usually have an uh, impression na uh, tamad yung ibang mga government officials, pero there are really also work, hardworking, uh, dedicated staff. Yes, you will meet uh, uh, frustrating systems and minsan mga hard-to-work people, pero there are also equally a uh, good number of people na who are dedicated and passionate about their work. And yun, siguro for the students here, you might also want to consider really working with government because the scale of the impact is also very promising and it's also a very good learning experience. Okay. Right, so thank you, Sir DJ. So we have also Sir Lian. Uh, so, very similar experiences then for okay, Dr. Rina and Sir DJ. Na very culture shock po talaga yung uh, working with government, especially coming from medyo... Uh, Uh, comfortable environment na nasa atin ngayon ang kami. Uh, and ayun, you you see may, may times na very frustrating din uh, yung sometimes yung work or yung deadlines and also the pressure na whatever it is that you say parang hindi mo siya mabawi ng madali eh. unlike in the academe or in the classroom if you say something wrong then pwedeng Oh, next meeting, iko correct pa siya. Pero dito is uh, once something is announced and something is being implemented, uh, ang hirap na yung ihabulin pa ulit. But also working with uh, or being more involved with people working in the government, you see a lot of people na very very dedicated in what they do, very passionate and uh, halata mo rin na pagod na sila pero they still pour everything into what they do and like sir dj sir benito then uh, i encourage then people if you want to work for government uh go ano talagang go for it and our uh, ayan may may malaking need then i think in government offices for people who are very ano very driven very competent and very talented All right, so thank you. So I uh All right, so now let's proceed to the next question. This is for Dr. Istuar. Were there any challenges during the development of Faster? And how about after it's turned over to D- DOH and can you share your experience with regards to acquiring data needed by Faster? Okay. So for the for the first question, there were a lot of challenges, no? Um, coming from eh, considering that uh, we have deployed the first version of faster already no in in a pilot site in region 6 no um, but but in the case of a real real pandemic or epidemic iba pala no so the challenge really is how to uh, from a project leader perspective is how to uh, make sure that you keep the spirits of your team up uh, uh, because uh, there are ups and downs uh, dun sa work namin no So aside from just uh, ano ba um, like uh, maximizing or utilizing most of our brain cells in, in trying to come up with the perfect model uh, and then producing the different analytics that are needed, um, there's also a challenge in making sure that we do it um, more efficiently and fast, no? Um, And so we always uh, use na lang the term kasi faster, eh, kailangan mabili- kaya dapat mabilis tayo palagi, no? Uh, parang by design, yun yung nangyari, no? Um, so yun, uh, nakakapagod siya uh, kasi you cannot show your team that you're tired. <laughs> so you have to also make sure that um, you inspire them every day, no? Uh, we, we accommodate, we, uh, we always have our regular sessions just to make sure that people are okay. Um, because syempre, we, are, we were also experiencing our own personal concerns during the lockdown, no? something that's very new to everyone. 
Um, and so we tried to manage that on top of the work. In fact, I think it was a blessing that we were busy no? uh, with that initially because we had le thought less of our uh, personal personal issues initially. No? Um, so at the at the at the requirement level, the project itself. Uh, the, the things that we had to deliver. So the model itself was less of a challenge, no? the design, maybe the codes, things that we, were, we had control with. No? Parang yung mga alam namin gawin, okay lang, uh, kasi implement lang namin siya. But the challenge was really first convincing people that this was the better model. Okay? Uh, we had to go through that um, second was the challenge of the data, which is also the question number three. No? Challenge of uh, getting the data, which initially was not streamlined. No? Because again, no, lahat naman nabigla dito. It's not just the Philippine government. It was the whole world. No? So putting up systems to collect the data was just starting and then was also being uh, streamlined. So yun, challenge of acquiring the data. Um, we had to we had to also not talk about it uh, because we had to sign a certain agreement no? it was very difficult because you were with your family day in and day out and you were just there doing stuff and you can't talk about it um so uh other challenges would be um i guess uh we we formed a group ad hoc no? they did not know each other and so we had to get to know each other quickly so mabilis na relation mabilis na relationship siya no? uh, hindi yung long term bago mo sagutin ang isa't isa no we had to be, be married right away and just discover each others uh, ano ba uh, mga, 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 mga habits and attitudes no there's a lot of human challenges actually more than the theoretical challenge which is where where we are trained at as academics no? but uh, Overall, I guess no, the challenge up to today is really um, making sure that faster is relevant and it will it, that it should be relevant day in and day out. So there's no, a non-stop uh, of reviewing what we have done, revising it because it does not work anymore, and adding things that are needed no, for, uh, to plan for our uh, recovery and, uh, and new normal. Um, after its turnover to DOH, um, so the turnover was really uh, just handing it over to DOH, uh, donated na siya officially to DOH because the system was stable. We changed the theme so that it really looks uh, like a DOH system, so parang sim symbolic yung pag-transfer, but the team is still on board working for DOH and working with DOH, no? So, so walang masyadong change. Medyo nakahinga na ata kami ng konti. Pero may next wave naman eh. Itong contact tracing data na kailangan nating pag-aralan. At saka yung ating socioeconomic data na kailangan na ding pag-aralan compared uh, against our health data. So tuloy-tuloy pa rin naman po yung work. Um, challenging pa rin yung data, especially ng contact tracing data ngayon. So parang naulit lang yun, naulit, parang cycle siya. But ngayon, mas alam na namin siguro uh, paano namin i-handle yung work, paano i-handle yung personal life, paano rin i-balance yung mga bagay-bagay. That's it. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Istuar. So one of your colleagues actually commended you. So you have been a great, very great leader as you navigate through the challenges. All right, so thank you again, Dr. Istuar. So let's move on to the next question. So from engineer Arnaldo Gagula. So the question is, how receptive were the LGUs in using FASTER, particularly in contributing data and in using FASTER outputs in their decision-making? Dr. Istuar? Okay, um, we've started uh, uh, training our LGUs initially through the DOST regional uh, offices, no? Um, and they were the ones who helped gather people, also Akadim, no, to be training uh, trainers also for us. Um, siguro, um, the first uh, issue lagi which we face, kasi kami yung humaharap sa kanila, is bakit iba yung data <laughs> ng, ng local sa national, no? 
And uh, we would always explain to them this process that there's a process of validation. Um, uh, at the onset, hindi naman po lahat nagsasubmit ng data dun sa tamang health system or preference po ng isang LGU na iba ang gamitin na system. Kaya maraming discrepancy sa data. So yun yung unang challenge no, to, uh, to justify uh, if our dashboard is the is the better dashboard kasi iba yung dashboard ng local at iba yung dashboard ng national. Um so yung reception nila initially parang parang not so not so embracing, no? They did not embrace us right away, especially those who already have their own systems in place. But not everyone has uh, has systems in place, no? So for those who do not have, uh they reached out to us, no? Personally minsan pa nga to to help them. Uh, set up this uh, dashboard for them and help them understand. No? So, parang the, our role became where we are needed. No? That's where we will focus because um, kanya kanyang strengths yung mga LG. And for those who reached out to us, uh, we, we, of course, uh, must, must uh, embrace kami and must appreciate it. And um, I think overall, ang magandang experience was we were the liaison for feedbacking to the government. No? So parang, oh, sabi po ng isang LGU, may discrepancy po. And then the government naman will respond directly and then fix it. No? So parang naging ganon, naging, naging ano kami, middle, middle person, middle, middle team to communicate to the government ano yung issues ng ating LGUs. Um, more recently though, uh, so alam nila si Faster, tapos nag-request sila ng additional features na LGU-specific, hindi na to IATF-specific or, or NTF-specific, mismo kay LGU, pwede ba natin itong idagdag? So, ganun kami ngayon, um, yun yung aming phase 2. We, we accommodate requests from our LGUs um, if it's something that can be generalized across all LGUs. No? So, that's how we are now with our LGUs. Uh, we have a uh, a lot, no, and it's it's more of together with DICT, we are we are hand holding them. As in, merong project manager per LGU na nakatutok sa bawat LGU, kinakamusta sila, ine ensure na nami meet nila yung requirements at na intindihan nila paano gamitin yung system. So I hope uh, it answered the question. So before we move on, so here's a question from Engineer Gatesa about maps used and the Purok approach analysis model. So Sir DJ answered your question that they don't have yet data on the Purok level. Okay, so now let's move on to the next question from Dr. Daniel from Dr. Daniel Mostrales from Hydronet Incorporated. So this question, this question is addressed to Dr. Istuar. One of the concerns during this pandemic is the loss of productive means of livelihood. Could we use faster to possibly have selective lockdowns only in places where COVID-19 cases could be considered critical and to free other areas which we know are of relatively low risk of being affected? Um, yes, the answer is yes. So Pastor provides that information, but of course, the decision to to uh, to issue a lockdown in a particular place does not come from Pastor. No, so so Pastor has that information because you can do scenario based projections. No, that's one um, for future decisions for decisions for the future uh, that will affect the future. But for specific lockdowns, yung, yung uh, pinag-usapan po ni, ni DJ and ni Lian are some examples. No? Pag geospatial, mas alam mo yung clustering or areas na potentially ma-affect nung spread. Yun yung initially pwede mong isipin decision yun for a lockdown no? or smaller lockdowns. Down to the barangay level because that's how we have uh, designed it so far. Pwede po yun. Um, right now, what we're working on is workplace or or uh, we call it super spreader centers, no? So work it could be workplace, it could be a mall, it could be a building, no? Uh, using contact tracing applications. Eventually, we will now <laughs> assignment to ni Lian and ni DJ <laughs> develop the same uh, 
clustering approach to the workplace naman for workplace lockdowns naman. So the answer is yes po. Uh, it is there in faster down to the barangay level, but it does not make a recommendation. No? It's really the user who makes a decision at the end of the day if it's going to use that particular information as one of the indicators for a, for a lockdown. Okay, thank you, Dr. Stuar, for answering that question. Okay, so let's move on now to the next question. FASTER was originally developed for the surveillance of dengue, measles, and typhoid. Was the transition to COVID-19 easy? Is COVID-19 more challenging than the three diseases? It wasn't easy and it, yes, it's, it's more challenging kahit na tatlo yung diseases na yan. Una, we were developing it parang on a more relaxed mode. No? We were using historical data and it was like an academic exercise uh, waiting for validation and verification from our users, which was uh, Region 6, the epidemiology team there and the uh, municipal health offices there. No? Uh, and so it was like a, a more of an academic exercise waiting to be implemented in the real world. But I guess it was really a preparation. No? Uh, in fact, the, the whole framework was something that we used in COVID, no? down to the data collection or patient screening na SMS, no? yung tanod COVID or ngayon tanod kira contra COVID, kasama din po yan sa pinag-aralan namin nung, nung three years ago. So um, it's different because uh, iba yung model, uh, bago yung sakit, no? hindi pa masyadong napag-aaralan. So, pwedeng ganito yung design today, tapos maybe six months from now, eto na nga, kailangan na namin i-review ngayon kung kailangan bang baguhin ang ibang uh, parameters doon or values doon. No? Um, uh, iba yung environment, iba yung users. No? Uh, at, at you have to make sure that the, you uh, help them interpret, no? which you are also grappling with because you're still discovering what this disease is all about. No? So it's really a big, a big, uh, big difference, but very thankful Now we had that past experience no? uh, before we engaged into the COVID-19 monitoring. Okay, so thank you, ma'am, for uh, answering that, that question. Okay, so moving on to the next question. This is from Anonymous and from an engineer, Alfredo J. Grandesa. This question is for Sir Lian and Sir DJ. How good are the models used by FASTER and is there some kind of calibration of the low and high criteria shown in the local autocorrelation maps? Sir Lian. Uh, I think mas ako po to. Uh, So in terms of models, uh, well, for for the barangay level, the ones presented by myself and Sir Benito, uh, it's only as good as the data that comes in. And so the the more information you have at a barangay level, the more reliable the results are going to be. Uh, you... Hmm, uh, pero yung for the models, uh, other models on the faster dashboard, like see the compartmental model uh, described by Dr. Dina, we have a more, uh, a different way to evaluate the performance because we can compare it with the actual number of cases and we have more accurate data at a higher granularity like the city level or the regional levels. So, uh, to add then, Siguro, for the, the model that I presented, it's really more of a, a snapshot eh, of what, what happened. So, uh, because it's a, it's a correlation, it's just describing how the data behaves. And the evaluation on whether or not the classifications are accurate, baka the LGUs can provide or will be able to provide more of an insight regarding the the performance because all we have is the are the numbers uh in terms of yung calibration uh siguro the only calibration really is the the smoothening process had addressed in the outers 
but the high criteria uh, is really uh, relative to the city level. For example, uh, guys in the province, then there, the average that you compute might be in up the cities. So, pang then yung big of a specified area. The goal really is to provide uh, information at barangay level. The nation that we can try. I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you, Sir Lian. Uh, do you want to add add up, Sir DJ? So, siguro just on the question of how good are the models used. So, uh, we just ensure that the math and the theory behind is uh, appropriate or reliable. We also have some, for most models, we also have uh, some model validation to check the goodness of it or how if we are, whether we are overestimating or underestimating the models. But I would just like also to point out that parang, there's a popular quote about models that uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So there's a, 10 instances that na are miss yung model. Because as what uh, sa sabi ni nabasa ko about modeling, uh, models are exaggeration of a particular certain reality. So it's only so it does not capture the entire reality. So there are certain uh, aspects of reality that are not considered no model. So with that, uh, there's really spaces for uh, concerns or errors. Pero ginagawa namin ng paraan na we meet regularly from time to time to check kung okay ba yung model at hindi siya sumasagod para at the very para make sure din namin na quality yung yung results na pinoproduce po ng models. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sir DJ. So I guess we only have a few minutes minutes left before we end the panel discussion. So let's proceed to the next question. So for Dr. Istuar, what's next after faster? Marami pa po. <laughs> uh, the work is not yet done. Um, and um, though we are a smaller team now, because uh, some of us needed to go back to reality, you know, go back to our real work, some of us are, uh, are will remain um, for the next six months or maybe more, uh, as long as uh, the government uh, needs our services for faster. So the next phase is really um, intended to first at the back end um, integrate, assist in the integration of all the other data sources which are now stable. No, yung mga systems na yan. Um, ang challenging. Uh, overall, is the contact tracing. No? There are a lot. There are, I think, twenty-seven and counting contact tracing applications. No, uh, so which are collecting a lot of redundant data. So the challenge there is uh, data cleaning. But after that, if it's cleaned and we develop a model for contact tracing, hopefully we will now again be able to identify which location yung pwedeng focus on ng uh, isolation and testing. No. Um, because that's the goal now, no? To make more efficient yung ating pag-detect, pag-trace, di ba? Pag-isolate, no? So even hindi pa nakukuha yung result ng testing, uh, pag-suspect or probable, dapat ina-isolate na. Mga ganon, ano? Um, so contact tracing modeling, contact tracing data, also uh, integrating the laboratory systems, um, so that we will know the positivity rate uh, down to the LGU level. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's the work that lies ahead. And more, more so uh, is the socioeconomic um, and health model. No? How do we balance these things, no? health and, and economy, uh, in preparation for the new normal? Okay, thank you, ma'am, Dr. Estuar. So at this point, I would like to ask the Vice President for Research, Innovation, and Extension, Dr. Wena Piverella, to give an insight about the topics discussed by our speakers today. Ma'am ma Wang? And dito ba si Ma'am Wang? Yes. 
Okay. Hello, good morning, everyone. Good, good morning. morning to our speakers. Uh, we have with us Dr. Stuar uh, Seriao and um, Okay, so um, thank you very much for the very, very enlightening talks about FASTER. Um, I'm not, I, oh, it's uh, Sir Benito pala. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I'm not really into mathematics and statistics, but it was very interesting for me uh, knowing that these are very important things no, that we, we should know especially that we are talking about COVID-19. So listening to the talks, for me, I think we really need to have a working knowledge in mathematics and statistics because these are very important foundations in developing uh, special models. And uh, I guess uh, this is very important uh, to explain patterns of behavior particularly on <clears throat> explaining the behavior of the COVID-19 uh, distribution, because uh, as I un understand, I'm an, I'm an ecologist, it also explains um, distribution and movement. So we need to understand also a lot of factors. And in the case of uh, modeling the movement or distribution of COVID-19, I, I think is quite challenging, especially that the response of the coronavirus to the different environmental factors is still being studied, um, not only in the Philippines, but in China and other parts of the globe. So for the epidemiologists, perhaps it's still a challenge for them to understand how the, the coronavirus would respond to say high temperature, low temperature, uh, relative humidity and so on. So that is quite challenging. And so there is still, I think, a, a, a question on this aspect. Then um, another thing is that there is also a need for interdisciplinary research as this would be very helpful to consider the various aspects of a certain phenomenon. Uh, as in the case of COVID-19, we need to understand the factors that can explain why the trend is so in this spe specific area, uh, like different regions in the country. So we need to understand that. So like uh, um, Professor Stuart mentioned about psychology, about uh, the, the socioeconomics and so on. So it's really, really good to have an interdisciplinary team working on this research. And uh, mathematical models are really very important guides for planning and decision making and uh, in making policies, especially for COVID-19, because we need factual basis in making decisions. It's not just because we want to do this and that, but we need to understand that we have to anchor this on factual basis. And another thing is that because of these developments, uh, particularly with FASTER, we have somehow um, aroused the Philippine government in understanding um, mathematical models as basis for planning and decision making, which gives um, the research community a good feeling because this will inspire us to work more in this area. And so congratulations to the FASTER team uh, led by Dr. Stuart. And uh, you have inspired, of course, our um, attendees in this conference, in this webinar rather. Um, and I think uh, Jujin and his team, the young, um, GIS and remote sensing people from the university and I have seen some of our attendees who are also working in that area will be starting to do their work uh, in relation to this. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ma'am Wang. Thank you, Dr. Varela, for the uh, message. So, to all our attendees, we apologize that we cannot accommodate all your questions right now. However, we have noted all your questions that are not yet answered. So, if you have more questions we didn't get to today or think of new questions, please message us at SciTech for the forum. Facebook page or the CCJO Facebook page. And we'll try our best to reach out the speakers so we can get their answer, we can get their answers to your questions, and we shall then forward it to you. All right, so to our speakers, Dr. Istwar Sirlian and Sir DJ, I would like to ask you a parting words or closing statement. So, and also I would like to ask this question, are there opportunities for collaboration with your research group and with APRE and how can we collaborate? Um, maybe to answer that one first. Um, uh, yes, there are always uh, opportunities in collaborating with the center. So center to center is a I guess, best way to initiate the collaboration. Um, the output ng FASTER are GeoJSON files no? for most of it. So yeah, I see a direct connection with, uh, let's say, any GIS uh, systems that uh, the center is working on or the students are working on. The contribution is really providing maps, map-based files or or easy way of mapping the, the, the files, the data, the health data, and different types of information in faster to the other uh, GIS platforms. No? So uh, just uh, feel free to send us an email. I can just give my email address later on uh, if there are any uh, requests no, for research uh, collaboration as we move from month to month no, uh, in this pandemic. Um, we are also ano eh, parang the, parang the, collaboration. the one stop shop no, for research inquiries. No? Uh, so a lot of other universities and students, uh, even up to high school level, you know, are asking us about certain things so that will help them do their research in relation to COVID. No? So marami pong opportunities to collaborate, but it starts with an email. No? Email, send an email indicating your inquiry and then we will uh, uh, work from, from there. For, uh, no, for parting words, I guess... Um, Research really plays a vital role in our lives. No? Uh, we just don't uh, feel it directly. No? But a lot of the things that we do and the reason why we are where we are is based on a study, no? based on research that has been implemented and that has affected us. So for the students who are, who are listening and maybe the young, young academic community, um, uh, you need to find meaning in your research no? uh, to make it more meaningful. And for me, the meaning is really if my work at the end of the day directly or indirectly affects the lives of, of, of uh, the human being, no? of, of individuals and groups. No? So even when it comes to the point now, it's very difficult already and you want to give up, you don't. Because you know that the end goal is really to uplift no, the lives of people. So it doesn't have to be that great and grand, no? You meaning it could be something as simple as I want to apply my work by math, no? In 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 the real life, no? But but the goal is to really find meaning in research, uh, to make the work, the hard work worthwhile. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Istwar. So let's move on to Sir DJ. Uh, siguro, in relation to Dr. Dokrina, uh, I hope we can do more research uh, to make better informed decisions na hindi lang basta tayo bara-bara. Kasi uh, decisions should be well-grounded on evidence, on data, para, kasi our decisions can also affect other people's lives. And Siguro, in relation na lang sa isang uh, question kanina sa Q&A about government work. So, for the young people there who are very passionate, we need uh, good people in government then. So, if given the chance, don't be afraid to work with government. 
it will be a challenging one, but I assure you it can be a fulfilling one and there's great impact in the work with Thank you. Thank you, Sir DJ. So last, Sir Leanne. Uh, Siguro for me, it's uh, it was hard to to be able to find a way to get involved with projects like this because of uh, background, our background, uh, me and DJ, of uh, more focused on finance and the corporate world. So uh, I was really lucky to have been given uh, this opportunity. And even though there's a lot of uh, pressure and stress, uh, I know also that it's it's really just the uh, uh, I've only tapped the surface of uh, what what can still happen and uh, what I can still do later on. And even though it's it's hard, it's it's very challenging at times. Uh, it's still uh, worth it in the end, uh, as long as what we do is being used and being used properly. I think. All the all the hard work and long and late night meetings are are all worth it. Okay, so to our speakers, thank you once again. So Dr. Istwar, Sir Lian, and Sir DJ. So thank you for your hard work and sharing your knowledge with, with us. So let's give them a virtual applause. Right, so at this moment, in gratitude to our speakers, we will now give them a certificate of appreciation. Right, so let me read a citation. Certificate of recognition. This certificate is awarded to Dr. Maria Regina Justina E. Estuar, in grateful acknowledgement and sincere appreciation for the great contribution as resource speaker of the responsive and intelligent suppression of COVID-19 and its impacts using spatial technologies, resist COVID-19 webinar organized by the Paraga Center for Geoinformatics, Caraga State University, given on the 14th day of October, October 2020 at Paraga State University during the celebration of Science and Technology for Development or SciTech for the 2020 Forum. Signed, Engineer Jujin R. Santillan, Director of CCJO, and Dr. Wena P. Varela, the Vice President for Research, Innovation, and Extension. Thank you very much, Mom. Thank you, Mom. Stuart. And of course, the same certificate of recognition is awarded to Lian Franzil L. Yao. Thank you so much, Sir Lian. And, and the last certificate of recognition is given to Daniel Joseph P. Benitos. Thank you also, Sir DJ, for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you, Sir. All right, so to our speakers, we look forward to more engaging and interactive activities with you. So together, let's work for the development of our nation. We thank you again, Dr. Istuar, Sir DJ, and Sir Leanne for gracing with us, for gracing this event with your presence. Thank you, Thank you, Mom. Thank you for the invitation. Mom, we'll have a group picture later on. All right, so now we need to make some important announcements. So this is just the first part of the webinar, and there will be a second part, which will be held on October 19, 2020, at 1.30 p.m. via Zoom webinar and Facebook Live. So another two excellent speakers will discuss us about trans plus or enhanced tracing for allocation of medical supplies, and Gideon or global impact detection from emitted light onset of COVID-19 and nitrogen, nitrogen dioxide. So they are the winner of best use of data during the NASA Space Apps COVID-19 Challenge. So don't forget, don't forget again to grace us 
with your presence. And also, we will formally close this webinar on that day. So to, all, to our participants, please be informed that your certificate of participation will be given in the next few days. You just need to ensure that you accomplish both the attendance sheets and evaluation forms. So I guess it's here in the chat box, the uh, evaluation form. So feel free to fill out the form now. And also thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar. I hope you learned something from our speakers and we look forward to seeing you again on the second part of the webinar. So goodbye and have a nice day.